Hello everyone and welcome to the first episode of A2 Chemistry with Fahad. And today he will be um, talking about proton M NMR spectroscopy. So over to you. All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Fahad Ansari and uh, there are already two videos uh, that you have seen um, in AS Chemistry on mass spectrometry and pH curves. So today I want to do take up an A2 chemistry topic that uh, comes up in pretty much every um, A2 chemistry exam, uh, which is paper four. And uh, I just wanted to cover this particular topic, proton NMR spectroscopy. Uh, it's a little long, but uh, I will try my best to cover this um, as uh, quickly and as um, concisely as possible. So um, let's begin with a deep dive into this particular analytical technique. All right, so basically NMR stands for nuclear magnetic resonance, right? And uh, the principle behind nuclear magnetic resonance is that uh, the nuclei of atoms, they have a certain spin, right? This spin about their own axes, and as a result, they create a magnetic field, right? And normally this uh, phenomenon occurs for nuclei with an odd nucleon number, right? So this thing is important, an odd nucleon number. So an example of a nucleus with an odd nucleon number is the uh, nucleus of the hydrogen one isotope, right? And the hydrogen one isotope only consists of a proton, right? So this particular proton spins about its own axis and generates a magnetic field of its own. And uh, the direction of this magnetic field can be found out using the right hand thumb rule that you may have studied in physics, right? So if I hold up my thumb like this, so you can see over here that the fingers are going to curl and show the direction of spin of the nucleus and the thumb is going to point towards the north pole of the magnetic field. Right, so I have a diagram over here in case you didn't understand my hand signals. So over here, this is a right hand and uh, the fingers are curling inwards showing the direction of the spin of the nucleus. In this case, uh, it is showing an anti-clockwise spin, right? And uh, the thumb is pointing towards the north pole of the magnetic field that this nucleus that is spinning generates. And obviously the opposite side will be the south pole. So with the molecule that has nuclei that are spinning and with the nuclei having odd nucleon numbers that generate a magnetic field as a result, um, if you apply an external magnetic field on such a substance, um, with these uh, nuclear magnets, then uh, the nuclear magnets are going to align either with the external field that you have applied from outside, or they're going to oppose it, right? And uh, obviously, if uh, you align with that external force, uh, less energy will be required than if you were to oppose that external force. It's kind of like, uh, you know, going with the flow or standing against the flow, right? Or going against the flow. So if you're going with the flow of a river, obviously you just need to sit back and relax and do the, let the river do the work for you. But if you're trying to move against the flow and rush of the water in the river, obviously you need more energy to do that, right? And so uh, the nuclei are split into two groups, right? So obviously when there's no external field, they're all at the same energy level. But when you apply an external magnetic field, you have two energy levels over here. The lower energy level corresponds with the protons, uh, basically the hydrogen one nuclei that are aligned with the magnetic field. So they need less energy. And if these protons were to gain a certain energy difference, delta E, if they were to gain a certain energy, you could flip them from being aligned to being opposed to the external magnetic field, right? Being opposed to the external magnetic field means that you need more energy 
to stand up against that mighty force that is the external magnetic field you've applied. Right. So the thing is that this delta E is very important, right? Uh, if I were to flip between these two energy levels from being aligned to being opposed, um, you need a small amount of energy to be gained by that proton, right? Or by that nucleus with an odd nucleon number, right? And this energy happens to be in the radio frequency range, right? And we know that radio frequency um, electromagnetic radiation has a low frequency and so low energy, right? And so as a result, if I were to go back to that diagram over here, if I have a proton over here and it gains a certain amount of energy which is equal to delta E and which is in the radio frequency range, it can go up to this higher energy level, right? And be opposed to the external magnetic field. And if it releases that energy, that same energy is released, it will go back to being aligned, right? So this uh, frequent switching between the two energy levels, this phenomenon is called nuclear magnetic resonance, right? Resonating between the two energy levels, being aligned versus being opposed and back again, right? But the gain or loss of energy in the radio frequency range. So this is the uh, whole concept of NMR. Now, <clears throat> the thing is that uh, what we normally do is we place the um, substance that we want to analyze in a solvent, right? And then we apply an external magnetic field and we try to study the radio frequencies at which certain protons begin to resonate, right? And that identifies the particular environment that proton is in. Now, what is an environment? An environment basically means what atom that proton or hydrogen one nucleus is bonded to and what other atoms are in that nearby vicinity, right? So this term is very important, environment of the H1 atom or the proton, right? And uh, basically, I'll explain what this environment is using the example, and then we'll get back to the rest of the stuff on the slide. So for example, we have ethanol, right? Um, you may be familiar with this because I use this example in mass spectrometry as well. And uh, over here, I have three proton environments. The first one is this one, right? The, there are three hydrogen atoms or hydrogen one nuclei bonded to this carbon atom that is further bonded to another carbon atom, right? So, this is one environment. These three hydrogen one nuclei are in the same environment because they're all bonded to a carbon atom that is only bonded to other carbon atom or hydrogen atoms, right? That's one environment. Second environment is this one, right? These two protons happen to be in the same environment. They're bonded to a carbon that is bonded to another carbon atom and an oxygen atom right? So this is a new environment, right? We're basically looking at the atom that the proton is bonded to, and then what other atoms that second atom is further bonded to, right? So we looked at the hydrogen atoms in this environment. They're bonded to a carbon atom. And then we looked at what else that carbon atom is bonded to, right? In this case, another carbon atom and an oxygen atom. So that's a second environment. Third environment is this one. This hydrogen atom is bonded to an oxygen atom that's further bonded to a carbon atom. So that describes the third proton environment, right? So now you have three environments. So that's going to result in three peaks shown in the NMR spectrum. Now in NMR spectrum, basically, um, it has an x-axis that shows a particular value that is called a shift value, right? So what is a shift value? Basically what that means is you're going to compare the radio frequency at which a proton resonates versus a given standard, right? The given standard that we use for proton NMR spectroscopy is 
tetramethylsilane, right? Basically, what this is, is we have a silicon atom bonded to four methyl groups. So CH3, 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 and CH3. So all protons in this are in the same environment, right? You can see that the protons of the hydrogen one nuclei, all three of these are bonded to a carbon atom that's further bonded to a silicon atom. Same case for these three and these three and these three, right? So the frequency at which these protons resonate, the radio frequency at which these protons begin to resonate, they begin to switch between aligned versus opposed to the external magnetic field and back again. That is your standard, right? And that is what we compare all other protons and all other possible environments to, right? And uh, this difference over here, we don't measure this in the uh, standard unit of frequency, which is the hertz, right? Uh, the reason is that uh, different NMR spectrometers have different um, magnetic field strengths, right? So to standardize across all NMR spectrometers, what we do is we convert these frequency differences from the standard to another unit, which is called a chemical shift, right? Symbolized by delta, and it's measured in parts per million right mm. so this is the chemical shift value basically tells you the difference between the resonance frequency of a given proton in a given environment versus the standard environment of a proton in tetramethyl silane also known as tms right so this was the basics of proton nmr so let's get into what an nmr spectrum looks like so over here, we have an NMR spectrum. On the uh, y-axis, we have absorption, right? On the x-axis, we have chemical shift, delta in parts per million. And uh, notice that the uh, x-axis starts from zero on the right rather than the left, right? Um, if you have already studied infrared uh, spectroscopy, then uh, you will also remember that uh, wave numbers on the x-axis begin from the right. So it's kind of the same convention. So over here, you can see three peaks. Uh, this is the NMR spectrum of ethanol, right? CH3, CH2, OH, right? So you have three different environments, and as a result, you have three different peaks representing those different proton or hydrogen-1 environments. Now, how do we tell which peak belongs to which environment? We use the shift values, right? We compare them to a table that will be given to you in the exam, yeah. right? This is all about uh, TMS, tetramethylsilane, right? And you will notice that there's a small peak at zero. This represents the peak because of TMS or tetramethylsilane, right? Obviously, the standard is given a shift value of zero. And all other environments are compared to that standard uh, environment, basically. So over here, you have the table, right? You have different environments of protons given, and you have the chemical shift range. So over here, I'm going to match the different peaks with the different environments. So for example, the first peak is at around 1 ppm. That is the shift value. And uh, this is because of the CH3, the CH3 in CH3, CH2, OH, because this is basically an alkane environment. You can see this example over here. So basically all protons being bonded to a carbon that's further bonded to another carbon, and that's it, right? And this is the case over here. This carbon is bonded to another carbon here. So this is going to be an alkane environment, and this is the shift range, and 1 ppm falls within this particular range. Second peak belongs to alkyl next to electronegative atom over here. So basically, this um, alkyl over here, the CH2, basically what this means is the protons are bonded to a carbon that is next to an electronegative oxygen atom, right? An example given over here, CH2O, right? 
shift range is 3.2 to 4, and this particular peak lies within that range. So this is because of this particular environment. And then finally, the last peak belongs to the hydrogen in the OH group, in the alcohol group. And uh, you can see over here, this is the alcohol environment, ROH over here. The shift range for the alcohol group is 0 0.5 to 6. Now that's a little large, right? Uh, as far as uh, shift in uh, value ranges go, but uh, this is for 5.3 ppm. It lies within 0 0.5 to 6, right? Now, one thing to remember is that when the hydrogen one nucleus is bonded to an oxygen or a nitrogen, basically when it's bonded to an electronegative atom, it's going to have a high uh, shift value range, right? And uh, now reasons for this will not be asked of you in the exam, but uh, suffice it to say that it has something to do with the fact that the hydrogen one atom bonded to O or bonded to N is involved in hydrogen bonding. And so because of that hydrogen bonding being a relatively strong intermolecular force, it's going to mess with the uh, radio frequency at which it resonates. So you need a large range just to make sure that it finally resonates, right? So this is a simple uh, NMR spectrum for ethanol. Now this was an example of a low resolution NMR spectrum, right? And normally in the exam, you will be asked about high resolution NMR. Now the thing is, in low resolution NMR, you get the different environments, right, of the protons. You get the number of protons in each environment, and that really depends on the height of the uh, peak given to you, right? If I look back at this particular NMR spectrum, this is the highest peak, so that suggests the greatest number of hydrogen atoms belonging to this environment. This has a lower height, and this has an even lower height. And so the number of hydrogen atoms in these environments is decreasing from three to two to one, right? So number of environments, number of protons in each environment, and what those environments are themselves using the shift values. Right. So now over here, the peaks over here are single peaks, right? They're singlets. Um, these signal peaks can be split, right? And that is what is shown by high resolution NMR, right? If you try to zoom in on a low resolution NMR spectrum, you will see that the peak is not one solid peak. It's split up into multiple peaks. And the reason for that is because of the protons of the neighboring carbon atom, right? So basically, it's not just about the environment of the proton, it's about the neighboring environment as well. That messes up with the peak and results in the split. And so we'll see just exactly how that goes, right? So each peak in a high resolution NMR split into further peaks, and that depends on the number of hydrogen one atoms that are bonded to the neighboring atoms, right? So over here, it says, if the hydrogen one environment that you're looking at has zero protons bonded to the neighboring carbon atom, it will produce a single peak called a singlet, right? And uh, um, one example of this is, um, let's say we take ethanol again. So this particular environment over here, this proton is bonded to an oxygen atom, right? Mm -hmm. Now, when I say neighboring carbon atoms, that assumes that the proton in the given environment is already bonded to a carbon atom itself. If it's not bonded to a carbon atom, how can you talk about a neighboring carbon atom, right? So this hydrogen is bonded to an oxygen. It's not bonded to a carbon. And so we will not look any further and say this hydrogen atom has zero uh, neighbors, if you will, right? And this is basically equal to N. 
And so the splitting pattern is given by the n plus one rule, which means that if you have zero neighbors, you will have one peak, which is called a singlet. So remember the peak that we had for the OH group um, towards the left side of the spectrum that we saw earlier, that would remain a singlet. It would not split up in higher resolution anymore. Right. If the hydrogen one environment has one proton bonded to its neighboring carbon atoms, its peak will split into two further peaks with their heights having a one-to-one -one ratio. This is called a doublet, right? In the case of ethanol, we don't have such an environment, right? But uh, I will continue this rule and say that if a hydrogen environment has two protons bonded to its neighboring carbon, it will split up into three peaks, right? So this particular CH3, it is basically the hydrogens are bonded to a carbon whose neighbor is bonded to two hydrogen atoms. And so over here, number of neighbors is two. And following the n plus one rule, this will be resulting in three peaks. And so the peak for this particular uh, CH3 environment would be a triplet. And uh, finally, for this environment, these two hydrogen atoms are bonded to a carbon that is further bonded to a carbon with three hydrogen atoms bonded to it. So that means the number of neighbors is three. And so according to the n plus one rule, that means three plus one equals four peaks. And so the peak for this particular environment will be split up into a quartet, right? So you have three peaks because of three different environments. That was low resolution NMR. In high resolution NMR, you're going to further split these peaks depending on the number of hydrogen one mm. nuclei bonded to the neighboring carbon atom, right? And so mm. you will have the splitting pattern. These are called splitting patterns. And the heights of these peaks um, in the doublet, they would follow a one to one ratio. In a triplet, they would follow one ratio, two ratio, one. In a quartet, uh, over here, they would follow what ratio three, ratio three, ratio one, um, height ratio for the four peaks, right? And uh, this particular pattern over here, the ratio of the heights, this follows Pascal's triangle, right? Maybe yeah. you've heard about this before. Pascal's triangle, basically, it looks something like this, right? The sides of this triangle are all ones, right? So you have ones on this side, ones on this side. And what you do is um, to get a number in the middle that's not on the side, you would add up the two numbers directly above it. So this two in the middle, you add up these two ones to get two. To get this three over here, you would add up these two numbers, one and two, directly above it. And to get this three, you would add up the two and the one directly above it. So this is basically Pascal's triangle. And uh, the first row represents a singlet. This represents the two peaks in a doublet with a one-to-one -one height ratio. This represents a triplet with three peaks with the peak in the middle being twice as um, tall as the two peaks on the sides. And finally, you have the quartet with this particular height ratio of the four peaks, it is split up into. So this is basically um, the splitting pattern, right? And uh, we've already looked at this example, right? As I said before, in ethanol, CH3 is split up into three peaks, which is a triplet. And you can see the height ratio, one, ratio two, ratio one, right? And the reason why is this CH3 is bonded to a carbon. So these protons are bonded to a carbon whose neighboring carbon is bonded to two protons. So that's N equals two. So according to N plus one rule, that means we are going to have a triplet. It's pretty cool how it follows Pascal's.
Yeah, I mean, uh, I was pretty amazed myself when I read this the first yeah. time. But still, so this CH2 over here, its peak is over here. It is a quartet. So you can see one ratio three, ratio three, ratio one, right? And uh, the reason is th these two protons are bonded to a carbon atom uh, whose neighboring carbon is bonded to three hydrogens. So that means uh, there are three neighbors. So according to the n plus one rule, that means three plus one equals four. So that's a quartet for this environment. And there was a triplet for this environment, right? And so finally, we have OH. Now, again, this hydrogen one nucleus, it's bonded to an oxygen. It's not bonded to a carbon itself. So we cannot talk about a neighboring carbon if it doesn't have a carbon in its own environment, right? So that is why um, we say that this has zero neighbors, right? And so this means mm. this will remain as a singlet. And this is shown over here. And by the way, if you recall, this OH peak was to the right in the low resolution NMR, but over here it is in the middle. Mm -hmm. Remember, it has a shift value range of 0 0.5 to 6. So it can lie anywhere in that range, right? And that is exactly what is happening over here. Right, so this yep. was the high resolution NMR spectrum of ethanol. Let's do another example, right? And uh, over here we have a high resolution NMR spectrum. You can see shift values of the x-axis in parts per million. And we have three peaks over here. So, mm. so now over here in these three peaks, um, the first peak on the right, this has a splitting pattern of a triplet. This has a splitting pattern of a singlet. And this has a splitting pattern of a quartet. So you can immediately see the splitting pattern. So that means that uh, over here for the quartet, n plus one equals four. So that means n equals three. So there are three hydrogen one nuclei on the neighboring carbon atom to this environment. So singlet over here means that n plus one equals one. In other words, n equals zero. And over here, n plus one equals three. And so n equals two. So we are working our way backwards now, right? We have been given the splitting pattern first. And then from that, we are uh, basically figuring out the number of hydrogen one nuclei in the neighboring carbon atom environment, mm. right? Okay. So... Now we use the shift values to identify to identify this particular mm -hmm. um, molecule and its environment. So this over here has a shift value of around, uh, let's say 1.2, right? So this shift value of 1.2 over here um, tells us that this belongs to an alkane environment, right? This belongs to an alkane environment. Uh, so we will note this as alkane. Keep this to the side for now. Mm. Now this other peak over here at a shift value of around two, so it's shift 2.0. Mm -hmm. Now this uh, could indicate that uh, we have an alkyl next to C double bond O. Well. The range is slightly above two, but uh, remember that um, the peaks can be slightly above or below the stated shift ranges, right? So yeah. over here, I have matched this 1.3 ppm, right? Um, with a CH3, an alkane environment, right? And uh, I'll need to erase all this. Just give me a moment. So this environment at a shift value of uh, 2.0 basically tells us that this is an alkyl next to C double bond O, right? 
And finally, we have a third peak at a shift value of around 4.1. And uh, this lies close to this range over here, which is alkyl next to an electronegative atom. And so this will be that particular environment. So 2 ppm, this singlet belongs to this environment, with, which is close to this particular shift range, alkyl next to C double bond O. And the first peak lies within this particular range for the alkane environment, right? Now, how did I come up with these number of hydrogen atoms or protons in this? That really depends on the, the neighbors, right? The neighbors that we mm -hmm. identify, right? Um, and that will help us basically piece this uh, puzzle together. So basically what happens mm. over here is this um, CH3 over here, this CH3 has a triplet, right? That is the splitting pattern, which means N equals two, right? Mm. So that means this should be bonded to a CH2 right? If it is bonded next to a CH2, then that would tell us that uh, it has two neighbors over here. And so we have a triplet splitting pattern. And similarly, this CH2 is next to a CH3. And so it has three neighbors. And so we have a quartet over here, right? And this is next to an oxygen to complete its environment, right? According to the shift value, and then finally, we have the CH3C double bond O, right? Which would complete the molecule right here. So we have an ester, right? We have an ester with this particular functional group, right? And to sum this up, um, this CH3, its peak is this one, right? Which is a triplet which means it has two neighbors. And uh, these are the two neighbors that I'm talking about, right? And the shift value 1.3 told us that this is going to be an alkane environment. The, the three hydrogen atoms of this are going to be bonded to a carbon that's further bonded to a carbon, that's it. Then this CH2, this particular environment, has a shift value 4.1, which tells us it is next to an electronegative atom, which is this oxygen. And it is also bonded to a carbon that has three protons bonded to it. And so these are the three neighbors that cause it to be a quartet. And then finally, this CH3 over here, mm. um, this is bo uh, bonded to a C double bond O that is showed by its shift value, mm. right? And it is a singlet, right? It is a singlet. The reason is mm. that the carbon that it is bonded to, this environment is bonded to, has no protons bonded to it itself. And so mm. all of this information that helps us uh, combine everything and get the structure mm. of a molecule, right? And this is going to give you an ester, which mm. is ethyl ethanoate right and this is your high resolution nmr spectrum for this mm. right now a couple of uh, last pointers before we go on to the workout is that um nmr spectroscopy obviously occurs when you dissolve the uh, substance being analyzed in the solvent and normally we use organic solvents to dissolve organic substances right and uh, we tend to use um, organic solvents that have um, its hydrogen atoms replaced by deuterium atoms, right? So for example, we have uh, CdCl3 over here. So basically this D is an isotope of hydrogen, which is hydrogen 2. And remember that only nuclei with odd nuclear numbers, they show up on the NMR spectrum. If we replace the hydrogen with the deuterium atom, which has an even nucleon number, it's not going to show up at the NMR spectrum. And so the organic solvent with its hydrogen one atoms replaced by hydrogen two atoms will not give a peak in the NMR spectrum. And so it will not mess up with our 
results, right? So this CDCL3, instead of CHCL3, right? This would have been trichloromethane. So this is trichloromethane. The only difference is the hydrogen is replaced by its other isotope, which is deuterium. And this is called a deuterated solvent. Deuterated solvents do not mess up with your NMR spectrum and help you dissolve the uh, substance being analyzed without giving off their own peaks because of their own hydrogen one atoms, right? You replace them all with uh, hydrogen atoms with an even nucleon number that will not show up in the spectrum, right? And uh, remember what I told you about uh, hydrogen being bonded to oxygen or nitrogen, right? They have very wide ranges of expected shift values, right? For example, for hydrogen bonded directly to oxygen, the shift range is 0 0.5 to 6 parts per million, right? Oh. And uh, this wide range is not very helpful, right? It overlaps with other shift ranges of other proton environments. So how do we tell it apart? Well, the thing is, you can do the NMR spectroscopy twice. Once with uh, the deuterated solvent CDCL3, and then you replace that with heavy water, right? Heavy water is basically um, water, H2O, except that instead of the hydrogen, you have deuterium, right? So what happens is the deuterium in a D2O, right, heavy water, is going to swap with the hydrogen one nucleus in the OH or NH group, and so it will cause its peak to disappear, right? So for example, in this reaction over here, the H is replaced by a D from D to O, and so this becomes OD, and we know that deuterium has an even nucleon number, and so this will not show up in the NMR spectrum, right? And so once you have peaks disappearing, once you add D to O and do the NMR spectroscopy again, that tells us the peak that disappeared was either an OH peak or an NH peak. That confirms it for us, right? Rather than the wide shift value range that did not tell us much, basically, right? So this is a way of confirming whether or not you have an OH or NH group or environment present. Right. All right. So this is all about NMR spectroscopy. And uh, now let's go into the example questions that uh, we can expect for this particular topic. Yeah. And for this, obviously, you will be given this whole list of um, proton environments and their shift ranges in parts per million that you will need to use to identify the environment that a certain proton mm. belongs to. Right. So first question, this is the easiest kind of question that you could get, right? You have been given the structure of the molecule, right? One phenyl ethanol over here, right? And uh, all they're asking is, I mean, they've already given you the number of different proton environments, right? All you need to do is fill in the table, right? With the number of protons in each environment, the environment itself that's responsible for a peak at a given shift value, the splitting pattern, and the result on shaking with D2O or heavy water. Remember that uh, makes one of these peaks disappear, right? So over here, they have already filled out the last row for the C6H5 group, right? C6H5. So basically, this uh, is part of the phenyl group or benzene ring. So if I draw the structure of this over here, so this is your phenyl group, and this is bonded to a carbon that is bonded to a hydrogen, an OH, and then a CH3. This is the structure of one phenyl ethanol. The five protons the five protons in this environment or the five H1 atoms um, are basically resulting in this multiplet splitting mm -hmm. pattern, which basically means more than a quartet, right? And uh, this peak will obviously remain 
when you shake it with D2O because D2O will only cause an OH or NH peak to disappear, right? So um, now, now the reason why this is a multiplet, the reason why this is a multiplet over here is because if, you, if I look at each carbon atom in this, this benzene ring over here, mm -hmm. basically I have carbon atoms in this. I have six carbon atoms. And uh, each of them is going to be bonded to one hydrogen atom, right? And this one over here, because it's bonded to a carbon, so it's not bonded to a hydrogen. So there are five hydrogen atoms over here, right? And uh, draw the benzene ring over here. Okay, so this hydrogen over here is bonded to a carbon whose neighboring carbon atoms, this one and this one, well, this one does not have any hydrogen atoms. This one has one hydrogen atom. So that's one neighbor, right? So I'm going to tally the neighbors, one over here, right? Then for this second carbon atom, its two neighbors over here and over here have two hydrogen atoms, one here and one here. So that's going to be two other neighbors. And then basically you can continue this, right? For this particular carbon atom over here, you have two neighbors. For this carbon atom, you have two neighbors. And for this, you have one neighbor. And so you can keep going on and on. And this is going to give us a lot of neighbors, basically. And that is why you have a multiplet, right? And uh, for the other environments, this particular um, shift value 1.4, this tells us that this is going to be an alkane environment, right? If I look back at this list, alkane within this range is 1.4, right? And there's one alkane group over here, which is CH3. These three protons are bonded to a carbon whose neighbor is another carbon, right? So this is an alkane. So there are three hydrogen one atoms responsible for the speak. The group responsible is CH3. And the splitting pattern for this will be what? Well, the neighboring carbon to this environment is bonded to one hydrogen. So that's one neighbor. So N equals one. So according to the N plus one rule, this is going to be a doublet. And result on shaking with D2O, well, the peak will remain. Mm. Now the next peak over here at 2.7, well, if I look back over here, 2.7, well, if I look at uh, this in detail, um, this 2.7 over here at this 4.0, mm. out of these two, the 4.0, it fits in this particular range which is alkyl next to electronegative atom, right? And over here, we have this CH, which is next to an electronegative yeah. atom. This environment is next to an electronegative oxygen. And so yeah. uh, this will be one hydrogen, one atom in this environment. The environment will be the CH, right? CHOH, just to cl uh, clear the explanation. The environment is next to an electronegative atom. And uh, this carbon atom neighbors this particular carbon atom with three hydrogen atoms on it. And so that is basically three neighbors, n equals three. So three plus one equals four. And so this is going to be a mm. quartet. And this peak will remain. And finally, we have one hydrogen one atom in the OH group. And this is going to be a singlet because it does not contain a carbon atom in its environment. So we cannot talk about a neighboring carbon atom, right? And so this peak will disappear because the hydrogen one atom will switch place with the deuterium in D2O to confirm the presence of the OH peak, right? So this is basically how you fill out such a table. Right, now over here we have a question. Uh, we have three 
substances over here, propan-1-ol, propanal, and propanoic acid. And uh, we need to identify using this NMR spectrum which substance this is going to be, right? And so how do we go about this? So first of all, um, I'm going to go with propanoic acid, CH3, CH2, CO, OH, right? So um, for this, the CH3 over here is an alkane environment because the environment is bonded to a carbon atom, right? And it has two neighbors. So that means N plus one equals three peaks. So that's your triplet over here for this CH3. This CH2 over here has three neighbors. So that's going to be three plus one equals four. That's a quartet over here, right? And uh, this shift value confirms for us that this is going to be, uh, you know, not a simple alkyl environment. If I look back over here, we could have alkyl next to C double bond O in this particular range, right? 2.2 to 3, and the shift value was 2.2, right? Mm -hmm. This is an example that we have in this case of propanoic acid. And so this is going to be alkyl next to C double bond O. And finally, we have this hydrogen that is bonded to an oxygen. And so it's going to be a singlet. So no neighbors. Mm -hmm. So it's a singlet according to the N plus one rule. And shift value is very close to 12. And if I look back on this table, um, for the carboxylic acid group, this over here, this proton will belong in a shift range of 9 to 13. Mm -hmm. Right? So 9 to 13, this is well within range. So this is actually going to be propanoic acid. Now the next part it asks us, state one feature that would be seen and why in the proton NMR spectra of each of the two compounds that are not C. Right? So if I look at propan one all CH3, CH2, OH, right? Yes, I would have this CH3 peak, um, same as the CH3 in propanoic acid. And this CH2 peak would also be pretty similar, um, except that it would have a slightly higher shift range because it is not next to a C double bond O as it was in the case of propanoic acid, but it's next to an oxygen, right? So that would have a slightly different shift range. Alkyl next to electronegative atom. This would be the shift range over here, right? Right. And so this over here is going to be the difference. You're going to have a singlet for the OH, right? So for propan one all over here, you have a singlet at a shift value of 0 0.5 to 6. Mm. for the OH. That is the difference for propan one all And for propanal, for propanal, what will be different is that uh, we have CH3, CH2, C double bond O, H, right? This peak will be the same for CH3. This will be the same for CH2 as in the case of propanoic acid because you have alkane over here. And over here, you have alkyl next to C double bond O. So same environments, same number of protons, and so same shift values and same splitting patterns. The only difference is for this hydrogen, right? Now, if I look back at this list, um, this will be for the aldehyde, right? The hydrogen bonded to C double bond O. And this would be in this particular shift range, right? And this would also be a singlet. The reason is, well, actually, it won't be a singlet. But the reason is that this hydrogen one nucleus bonded to a carbon atom, its neighboring carbon is bonded to two hydrogens. So that would be two plus one equals three. So that would be a triplet, actually. A triplet at a shift range of 9.3 to 10.5 ppm. 
for the no. C double bond O H, this particular proton, right? So these are the differences uh, between the NMR spectra of these three compounds, right? Right. Now, this is the other type of question that you could get. Now, this is the harder type of question. Now, you don't have uh, any information apart from the molecular formula of the compound, right? Now, by considering both the relative peak areas and the shift values, use the data booklet to deduce the part of the molecule that produces the peak at shift 2.2, right? Now, over here, these relative peak areas, what they mean is basically the numbers of protons that are given above the peaks, right? So this data will be sometimes given to you, sometimes not. So you shouldn't be fully reliant on this, right? So over here, you have 2 plus 2 plus 3 plus 3. That gives us 10 hydrogens, and that is correct according to the formula, right? So at shift 2.2, which is this peak over here, you have a singlet. You have a singlet, and uh, the shift value is around shift uh, 2.3, let's say. Sorry, 2.2. It's already given, right? Shift 2.2. And so if I look back, yeah. the shift 2.2 matches with this particular range for alkyl next to C double bond O, right? And it has three yeah. hydrogen atoms in this. So this is going to be CH3, C double bond O, right? So it's going to be CH3, C double bond O. All right. Yeah. Now it says, deduce the part of the molecule that produces the peaks at shift 1.2 and shift 3.5. So at 1.2, you have this peak, which is a triplet splitting pattern. And its shift value, obviously, is 1.2. And this falls within which range? It falls within the alkane range, right? This one. Uh, yeah. So this is going to be uh, CH3, right? And um, this 3 is because of the 3 given over here. Uh, this is a triplet, which means that the CH3 will be next to a carbon that is bonded to two neighbors, two neighboring protons, and so that's CH3, CH2, right? So that is CH3, CH2, and the peak at 3.5 over here, now this is a quartet, and uh, its shift value is relatively higher. It's at 3.5. So if I look back, 3.5 fits in within this range, alkyl next to electronegative atom. So alkyl next to electronegative atom, which means it has two hydrogen atoms. It is next to an oxygen, right? So the CH2 O part gives us that peak. At the CH3, CH2 part gives us that first peak that we were looking at at 1.2. Right, and by the way, this uh, quartet over here is because uh, this particular environment circle in the middle, this has three neighbors over here, and so that will give us three plus one equals four peaks. So it's going to be CH3, CH2 over here, and then finally, the peak at shift 4.0 is a singlet, and it has two hydrogen nuclei in it, hydrogen one nuclei. So what do we do about this one? So for this, um, what mm. we could do is um, we could have a CH2 that is next to an electronegative atom, right? Because this is at the far end of that range. If you look again at that range of 3.2 to 4.0 again, so that is alkyl next mm. to electronegative atom, and it has two hydrogen one nuclei in that peak, and so that's going to be CH2O. Now we need to put these uh, puzzle pieces together. And so what we're going to do is we have CH3, C double bond O over here. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have the CH3, CH2O. This is going to be one end of the molecule, CH2, CH3. Now what comes in the middle? Now the thing is, 
that uh, this singlet at the end is because of another CH2O. It's not going to be the same as this CH2O that we were looking at earlier. It's going to be different. So what we can do is we can look at this particular formula and compare it to the molecular formula. We have one, two, three, four carbon atoms already used up. We have three plus two plus three, eight hydrogens already used up, two oxygens already used up. And so we are left with a CH2 and that will fit right here. Right, yeah. So this CH2O is basically giving you the peak at shift 4.0. And this CH2O is giving you the peak at shift 3.5, right? The quartet that we looked at earlier. So this is going to be your molecule over here. And um, apart from NMR, uh, there are other chemical tests that can confirm the structure for you that can confirm the presence of certain functional groups. So the next part, it tells us basically that when reacted with alkaline aqueous iodine X produces a yellow precipitate. This was compound X all the time, right? So the structure that we came up with was CH3, C double bond O, CH2, O, CH2, CH3, right? And it is this part that will react with alkaline aqueous iodine to give you a yep. yellow precipitate. And the yellow precipitate you will have already studied is triiodomethane or iodoform. So this is basically um, confirming for us that the structure we came up with using the NMR spectrum is in fact good. Right. Now, compound W is an ester with the molecular formula C5H10O2. So this is an isomer, right? So this is an isomer of X. So the proton NMR spectrum of W contains only two peaks and the relative areas of these two peaks are in the ratio nine, ratio one. So that tells us that one environment has nine protons in it and the other has only one proton in it, right? So that gives us a total of 10 and 10 is what is contained within this formula, right? So, how do we go about this? Now we have an ester, right? Remember, this is an ester. So it has to be C double bond O, single bond O over here, right? Now what I could do is uh, I could place a hydrogen over here, right? And I could place all nine hydrogens on the other side. And how I would do that is I would place them in three methyl groups so that they're all in the same environment, right? All nine of these protons, three, three, and three, are bonded to a carbon that is further bonded to another carbon. So all three of them are in the alkane proton environment. Um, and collectively, all nine of them are in the same environment. So that'll give you the one peak with the height of nine units. At the height of one unit, will be obtained from this particular mm. proton over here, right? So that will give you this ester, W over here, nine protons in the same mm. alkane environment uh, with corresponding to the same peak with the area of nine units or the height of nine units and the other proton with an area or height of one unit no. in comparison. Right. So a um, few last questions. So this no. is... Uh, an NMR spectrum of an amide. Now, amides are basically compounds with this particular functional group. And this is in the solvent of CDCl3. Now, it asks us first why CDCl3 is used as a solvent instead of CHCl3, right? So, obvious answer is that this is deuterium. It does not show up in the NMR spectrum, but hydrogen 1, it does, right? So, simple answer for this would be um, so that no peaks um, from the solvent are recorded in the NMR spectrum, right? Or recorded yep. in NMR. So this is the simple answer. Now the next question asks us, uh, given us the structure, 
Now we need to identify the different peaks belonging to the different environments at their shift values. So we can, uh, without even looking at the data booklet, we can look at the NMR spectrum over here. Uh, this is going to be, um, if I draw the structure over here, CH3, C double bond O, and H, CH2, CH3. So for this, first of all, um, we have CH3, which has two neighbors. So two plus one equals three. That's your triplet over here. So mm. triplet means n equals two. So the shift value for this is, uh, say it's around um, shift of 1.3, right? So we can write 1.3 over here. Sorry, not over here, over here. Right, next one over here is CH2. Now this CH2 has three neighbors over here, right? So that's going to result in a quartet. And this is your quartet over here with three neighbors, n equals three. And uh, because it's next to an electronegative nitrogen atom, so its uh, shift value is slightly higher. And so this is around shift uh, 3.2 ppm. So we will write that over here, 3.2. Yeah. Now, this hydrogen over here uh, is bonded to a nitrogen, right? And so it will have a singlet. Um, but um, we still have another singlet over here. So which of these two uh, would be the particular singlet for NH, which would be for the CH3C double bond? We'll have to take a look at the data booklet now. So this CH3 over here, uh, its neighboring carbon has no hydrogen, so it also will have a singlet. So let's look yeah. at the data booklet now. Um, the NH in the amide group, this one, this last one, this proton, hydrogen bonded to N yeah. is in the range of 5 to 12, so pretty large range, right? And uh, for alkyl next to C double bond, oh, the range is just 2.2 to 3. Right, so if I go back, question this singlet is over here, right? Singlet n equals zero, and this lies within the shift range for alkyl next to C double bond O, or actually slightly below it. So this will be shift of uh, 2.0 for this one, actually. And for NH, this will be the singlet that represents it because it's bonded to a nitrogen. There's no carbon in that environment, so we cannot talk about any neighbors. Yep. So this is going to be a shift value of around six point, let's say seven, six point seven. Now, finally, it says explain how the proton NMR spectrum of the amide differs when dissolved in D2O rather than CdCl3. So oh. in this case, one of the peaks will disappear. It's going to be this one. It's going to be this particular peak for NH. So the peak or singlet, you could say, yeah. at shift 6.7, it disappears in D2O. And the explanation for this, you can just write the equation that I gave you earlier, right? Show the exchange of the proton in the NH group with the deuterium atom to make sure that this particular deuterium atom with an even nucleon number gives us no peak in the NMR spectrum, right? And so that is basically the difference that you will get. And that will confirm to us the singlet that represents the proton bonded to the nitrogen with a wide uh, shift value range, um, which is not very helpful. So the D2O will be useful to confirm its presence, right? And so that's the end of the uh, end of our topic. It was pretty long and it was yeah. pretty, uh, challenging as well. It's one of the very challenging topics of A2 chemistry, but I tried to make this, uh, you know, as short and concise as possible. Uh, and I really hope that you did 
uh, managed to learn something from this whole exercise. <laughs> yeah, this topic yeah, seems think. really intensive. Yeah, and it requires yeah. a lot of practice. But the good thing is, the good news is that uh, this question comes up pretty much every year in every paper almost. And so you have plenty of practice questions to deal with once you're doing this topic. Right. Yeah. All right. Uh, thanks for watching this episode of A2 Chemistry. Um, what would we be talking about next time? Okay, so next time uh, I was thinking that uh, another A2 chemistry topic that uh, yeah. um, is not maybe as intense or um, difficult to get into or as detailed, but uh, it is still a topic that stumps a lot of students, especially when they're solving past paper questions. So uh, I was thinking of maybe keeping a longer workout for that one, and that is the topic of buffer solutions. So calculating the pH of a buffer solution and how we can go about that, that's what I was thinking of for the next one. All right, well, stay tuned for next week for um, buffer solutions with Fahad, I guess. Um, see you next time. Bye. Bye.